Hello again, kids. Hi, it's me. How are you? <laughs> yes, uh, I know I'm, I'm looking a little sunburned today, and that's because um, last week my brother-in-law's dogs went missing, and, you know, he just loves his puppies. So to help out, I printed up a bunch of flyers, and my, my dog, Titus, and I, we walked around town and put up a bunch of flyers just to help help him out, see if we can, you know, find him. And luckily we were, we were able to, but I'm part Scottish, so <laughs> I'm actually like a light blue until I tan a little bit and then I'm white, so that much exposure, even with like one of the highest SPFs ever, I'm still gonna sunburn. I should have taken that into account, but I didn't even think. So, yeah, I'm a little sunburned, so sorry. You know, you get kind of the, the outdoorsy Mama Phoenix today. But I wanted to discuss a couple of things. Um, first, you know, there's a lot of stuff on gun control going on right now, and I'll probably do a separate video on that at a later date. Uh, I'm thinking doing something with regards to the overall surrounding history of the Second Amendment, because a lot of people want to cite the Second Amendment, and I don't think they fully comprehend. You can't just read a document like the Constitution and not take into account the historical happenings that were going on around surrounding the time period that this document was drafted and signed into law. You you just can't do that. You know, that'd be like looking at the at the Brown versus Board of Education ruling and not getting that segregation was a thing. You know? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> so we're probably going to do a video on that uh, within the next couple of days. But today I wanted to discuss the Nathan Riom case again. Because recently, the Innocence Project has reached out to Nathan Riom and offered help. And so, you know, now that there's some moon and shaking going on, I thought that we would discuss that a little bit. So I was going through uh, the, the court transcripts the other day. And I specifically uh, looked for the testimony of Andrew Hilborn. Now, Andrew Hilborn has admitted to being one of the people who committed the rape. He has admitted to, uh, you know, basically just being a douche canoe. Really, son? <laughs> he's very expressive, but because he's constantly vocalizing, I start to... After a while, because I'm like, really, dude? Come on. Um, now, I'm scanning these. So that we can put them up on a website. You know, we're still getting a lot of stuff together. But I wanted to discuss this because this little son of a bitch. Oh my God. <laughs> How the fuck people like this exist in the world and they sleep at night? I will never know. I will never ever know. How the fuck people like this can exist in the world. I just, I don't get it. I don't understand it. So, um, I was going through Andrew Hilborn's court testimony, and as you can see, everywhere, and this is not even halfway through his testimony, as you can see, everywhere that I've put a, uh, a little sticky note, it's because there's some shit in there that I'm just like, what the fuck? So, as you can see, you know, some pages have multiple sticky notes. What the fuck? Andrew, come on now. Okay, so we're, he was on day three of the trial. And it says here, this is a direct examination by the DA. And, uh... Let's see, it says, this is when he's in jail for the rape. He pled guilty. And it says, how long have you been in jail? He says, 11 and a half months. 
since July of 05, he answers July 1st, and the, then the question is asked, okay, where exactly in the jail are you housed? And the answer is located on 5C. The question then is, is that a particular area of the jail? And he answers, it's a mental health unit. It's a mental health unit. Right out the gate like that? It's a mental health unit? Really? So basically what you're telling me, District Attorney, is that your star witness, <laughs> the guy who tied it all together for you, is being housed in the mental health unit of the prison. That's the best you got? Really? Are you fucking shitting me? You are hanging in the balance the lives of three other young men on the testimony of a guy in a mental health unit. Now listen to me now and believe me later. Okay. My husband has bipolar 2 disorder. When he was in the army, he was in the Walter Reed Medical Center. I know all about mental health and, and, you know, things of that nature. I get it. But as a criminal justice student, soon-to-be lawyer, I also know that your star witness should not be somebody who has a mental health record. Especially considering the things that we learn about him later on down the line. That's point number one. Let's see... Uh, he says here, uh, before you were living in jail, were, when you were arrested, were you taking any medications? Oh, get this shit. Back up. Scratch that. Reverse it. After the mental health unit, question is, okay, are you taking any kind of medications while you're living in the jail? He says, yes. The question then is, what for? He replies, I hear voices. You hear voices? You hear voices. He says, before you were living in the jail, before July 1st of 05, when you were arrested, were you taking those medications? He says, no. Were you having the same kind of problems, though? He said, yes. Did you do anything other than taking medications to try to help yourself with that? He says, I smoked weed. What do you mean by weed? Marijuana. He says, did that help? He says, yeah. Are you having any problems today or anything? He says, no. How convenient. He says, I want to go back and talk to you a little bit about before you were arrested. Hold on a minute, kids. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> Sorry, my my little ones, you know, they, they never want anything to do with you until you're in the bathroom or on the phone or, in my case, doing videos. And then all of a sudden, it's all important that mommy talks to him. Going further into uh, Andrew Hilborn's testimony, he says, uh, well, he says, okay, so... They're talking about when he met Nathan Riom, and he says, do you know how old he was when you first met him? And he says, no. Okay. And he, the question is again, were they about your age or older? He says, older. Then he's asked, did you ever hang out with them? He said, a few times, yes. Uh, he says, now individually or in a group, can you... <sighs> Something got lost in translation. Oh, duh. Can you tell us a little bit about, and he says normally it was in a group. And then now he's, he's going down to uh, identifying one of the other perpetrators. And he says that, he asks him, talking about back in October of 2004, does Mr. McDonald look the same today as he did back then? Andrew says no. He says what's different? He says he's not bald. And they say, in October of 2004, he was bald. He says, yes. Now, here's the thing with that, kids. That's sloppy fucking police work. 
He's saying that a Mr. McDonald was not bald, or he was bald in October of 2004. Where's the proof? Where's the pictures? Where is anything that corroborates that testimony? There's nothing anywhere, anywhere in the record that corroborates that McDonald was bald in October of 2004. Nothing. There is not a fucking picture. There's not even an allusion to a picture. There's no corroborating testimony. Nothing that I have seen so far. That's just sloppy. I just want to point that out. Uh, okay, so then he says... Uh, specifically Saturday night, October 23rd. Do you remember that night? He says, I don't remember the exact date. He says, but did there come a time in October of 2004 when you met up with these three defendants? He says, yes. The question is, where did you meet up with them? He says, in front of my girlfriend's house. Yeah, here's my issue with that. Where's the corroboration from the girlfriend? Why hasn't she testified that they met up with her in front of the girlfriend's house? Is it probably because she would have testified that Nathan Riom was not in the car? Or that the occupants of the vehicle are different than the occupants that are on trial? Mm hmm? Inquiring minds want to know. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so he says... Uh, have you been in this car in the past? This is the car that the rape supposedly occurred in. He says yes. He said how, how many times? He says I'm not really sure. Maybe five or six. Maybe more. He says you were familiar with that car. He says yes. And the question is then you said it looks like a cop car because it had a spotlight on the outside. Was there anything else about it that made it look like a cop car to you? He says, well, the model of it, you see a lot of detectives drive that type of car. He says, so it's the same make and model as what police officers use. This gets important. He says, was there any other lights on the car besides the spotlight that made it look like a police car? He says, I don't remember. You wrote in it five to six times. You're able to tell the make and the model but you don't remember if it's got any other lights in it that would mark it out as a cop car? I call bullshit. And I'll tell you why. It is theorized that one of the actual, the, the defendant, the unsub that Nathan Riom took the place of is in fact a cop. Is it just me or does it sound like he's describing an actual police vehicle? But he's trying to save his own skin. Why? What the fuck is going on up there in New York? Uh, he says, I got in the car. I was sitting in... Sorry, a lot of things. He says, I was sitting behind the driver's seat. Scott was driving. I think Nate was in the front seat when I first got in. And then Sonny was sitting in the back. Here's the thing, though. That does not corroborate with the seating arrangement that the victim testifies to. She, according to her, Nate was sitting in the back seat and Sonny was up front. Do you see where I'm going with this? He then says, me and Nate got dropped off because you can't buy weed in a car that looks like a cop car. Where are these supposed weed dealers? I want names. Surely they could have promised the weed dealers immunity for testifying to this, but conveniently they've never been identified. That's just sloppy police work. Then it says, uh, let's see. This is after they've already spotted the victim and blah, 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 and she's getting in their car. And he says, did somebody agree to help her look for her car? He says, yes. Then the question is, do you know who that was? He says, I believe it was Scott and Sonny. Question, Scott and Sonny. He replies, yes. And then 
The question, the, the DA tells him, I ask you to keep your voice up nice and loud so everybody can hear you, okay? Why are you mumbling, Andy? Why are you mumbling in a court of law? Is it because you know that you're full of shit and you're trying not to actually say the shit? Could that be it? And here's the thing, kids, all through this testimony, that's all he does. He mumbles like fuck to the point where even the judge is telling him, you need to speak up. Why were you nice and loud and confident before, but now that it gets into the actual lying portion of our regularly scheduled program, you're mumbling. That's very telling. Very, very telling. Then they say, uh, were you able to notice anything when she got in the car? He says, I smelled alcohol on her. He says, what happened when she's in the backseat of the car with you? He says, we drove around looking for her car. He says, did you stay in the city of Syracuse? He says, yes. He says, in the beginning, he says, yes. The question then is, did you stop anywhere? He says, um, on Getty's, there's a store, Save a Lot, I believe is the name of it. We stopped so she could puke. That is nowhere in the victim's statement. Nowhere. She does say that they stopped the car so she can vomit on the side of the road, but she never said that they stopped at a store. He says, so the car stopped, and did you go into a parking lot or still on Getty Street? He says, no, we pulled into the parking lot. Again, never in the victim's statement. He says, did she get out of the car or to get sick or just lean out the window? He says, she got out of the car, puked, and got back in. He says, okay, back into the back seat of the car. He says, yes. He then says, what happened when she gets back into the car? He says, we drove around for a little bit more, and she wound up falling asleep. Get this shit, though, kids. Before falling asleep, was there any phone calls in the car? Objection, Your Honor, leading the witness. Oh, wait, this is direct. He can lead the witness. Damn it. Yes, yes, I know my battery's running low. He says, I think she tried calling her mother or friend or something like that. She says, do you know what phone she used? He says, I think it was Nate's. He says, do you know that for sure? He says, no. Now, here's the thing, kids. She herself admitted to making a phone call from one of the perpetrator's phones. And I'm not going to read all through all this right now just yet. It's just I found it very interesting how many lies that Andrew Hilborn is telling throughout the course of all this nonsense. And yet, it's just, it's, it's, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. So I just wanted to point that out. Now, the victim does state that she used one of the perpetrator's phones. It's later determined through investigation that it was Sunny's phone that she made the phone calls from. So why the fuck are they trying to insinuate that it was Nathan's phone? There's something very weird here. Don't bullshit me, Onondaga. This investigation from beginning to end was just fucking insanity. And like I said, I'm not going to read all this to you now because, you know, this is getting pretty long. But <laughs> I just wanted to point out some of the instances where Andrew Hilborn, the state star witness who hears voices and is a known and convicted pedophile, is blatantly lying in the courtroom and yet it's allowed. And they based his conviction on this shit. Anyways, that's what I have for this video. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to me here on YouTube. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Mama Phoenix 6 And if you have Boogie on over to the About page here on my channel, you'll find everything from my Facebook fan page to my Pinterest boards. Thank you all very much for watching, and we'll see you soon.